this is really the problem with using tariffs as an industrial policy strategy. Uh, if you want to try to uh, encourage the production of, of semiconductors in the United States, you can do that at really high cost, but you'll be putting higher costs on all those industries like the AI build out that use semiconductors. Um, and, you know, semiconductors, especially advanced GPUs, these are only made abroad currently. So impo imposing high costs, 100% tariff would increase the cost of those GPUs by about 75%. And that's going to be passed on to those final consumers, which, again, are those hyperscalers that are putting billions and billions of dollars into this build out. And that's going to make that more costly. All right. So, you know, uh, on the surface, it seems to be then uh, maybe a way to incentivize reshoring of capacity of manufacturing of those very chips uh, to the U.S. But I mean, but you and I, we, we both know, right, a name like TSMC, yes, they're building fabs in the U.S., but they're not going to totally 100 percent relocate everything to the U.S. I mean, it doesn't make commercial or economic sense. Absolutely. No, it, it absolutely is not. And this is this is the beauty of trade. You can put things where they're most efficiently produced and we all benefit from those uh, that distribution of, of production. The other thing I would note here is, you know, the reason or the way in which we put tariffs on semiconductors, um, you know, or the way we are, are planning on doing it is going to be under a national security justification, basically saying that we need access to semiconductors for national security. The thing about semiconductors is they are the most complicated thing humans have ever produced. So if you don't have access to all of the inputs, including gallium and germanium, which are predominantly uh, mined and processed in the PRC, you're still going to have trouble making semiconductors. So it's not reasonable to think that you can do all of that inside the United States. So we really do need a strategy that doesn't have sort of blanket tariffs on all inputs. So, you know, when you connect all the dots, uh, Phil, 100% tariffs, and if uh, most of the, all the chips we need to import from uh, abroad, from places like, well, Taiwan and TSMC, uh, right, uh, the cost of building data centers goes up, the cost of compute goes up, how much that uh, hyperscalers uh, sell it on to enterprise or consumers, that's going to go up uh, as well. Is there any sort of off-ramp to this? I don't, there's no off-ramp with, with the tariffs as they've been described. I mean, so the one thing I will note is that the, the headline number of 100% may not come into play, obviously. There might be a slight sort of taco in here. I mean, they've already described the fact that they could, you know, companies that even have plans to produce in the United States may, have, uh, may be uh, immune from the tariff. And you can also carve out certain types of, of goods. Um, so my, goal, my hope would be that some amount of this is carved out that reduces the size of the tariff. But then again, you run into the key problem, which is, by carving certain chips out, by carving certain companies out, or by carving certain jurisdictions out, you are then weakening the incentive to produce in the United States. So there's kind of only two ways you can do this. Either you commit to producing these things in the United States, which I think is the wrong decision, and you pay incredibly high costs to do it, but you are able to domesticize the, produ domesticize the production, or you have a patchwork system that increases the cost for certain chips, doesn't for others, it creates a lot of distortions, but at the end of the day, doesn't do a lot other than sort of creating costs for consumers. What about the argument, Philip, that U.S. actually doesn't import a lot of raw chips? A lot of chips that, that end up in the U.S. are actually coming in after being installed in products. And perhaps this is one perhaps a smart and very complicated way of getting something done in terms of tariff negotiations. What do you think? Yeah, so that's a very good point that I didn't raise and I should have, which is this is another complication with putting tariffs on semiconductors or another problem with trying to say, okay, the way we're going to incentivize domestication is by having tariffs on them because most semiconductors come into the country embedded in products. So you have, then you have two choices. You can either put tariffs on products that have embedded semiconductors based on the value of the semiconductor, yeah. um, which for things like a car won't really change the calculus very much. But for a phone where the tariff, it, where the chip is about 50% of the value, that'll really increase the price of a phone. Um, or you yeah. put tariffs on products based on whether those chips are in there at all, and that would drastically increase the price of a car. So th this is just a very complicated thing to do with a, a blanket tool like a tariff. Here, a much better strategy might mm -hmm. be industrial subsidies, right? Subsidized production rather than tariffing inputs. Mm -hmm.
Phil, listen, I think we need to talk about the, uh, this 800-pound gorilla uh, in the room, which we haven't yet, which is China. I mean, the whole point is, uh, 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 the whole point behind the president's AI blueprint is to, to get the U.S. to AI supremacy and, and keep it there and make that happen ahead of or before China, right? The strategy with regards to chips has changed drastically, and I want to get your take on this, and this is within just the last couple of weeks, right? It used to be deny... Now it seems to be, okay, look, give them what they want, H-20s, et cetera, so that, we, you know, that we literally uh, make it their crack, right? We keep them addicted to our AI stack. D I mean, is, is that going to work, do you think? I mean, over at CSIS, how are you guys thinking about something like this? Yeah, so, I mean, I think th there's, there's really smart people who disagree on the H-20 case. I think the one thing that most people do not disagree on is that it was a bad idea to mix commercial agreements, which is basically our fight over tariffs, with export controls. Right? Those two things have been separated for a very long time for good reason. Export controls are about national security. They're about non-proliferation. They're about dual-use technologies. That's the sort of thing where you really want everyone to be on the same page. This is about security. Um, trade, uh, tra trade negotiations are a very different thing. Um, and the reason that that matters, not just because I'm a purist and like to keep those things separate, the reason that matters is for our export controls to work, we need partners to come along with us. We need to convince the Japanese, the Dutch, the Koreans that these things are necessary for all of our collective security and not just because of our, our company's sort of commercial interests. And that becomes harder when we start to use these things as chips in an, on, in an ongoing negotiation. Um, the other thing I would say, too, is that, you know, I think it's really reasonable to say that, look, we, we may not have had the, the exact um, mix of controls right. Um, you know, under the Biden administration, we did a lot of additional controls and we really weren't slowing them down in a substantial way. So I think it's reasonable for the administration to sort of rethink this, but mixing the sort of strategic um, national security objectives with sort of just commercial negotiations, to me, is a really bad decision. Mm.